Welcome to episode 2 of Art Fundamentals for 3D Artists. In the last episode we talked about lighting, today we're going to talk about something which is just as important and that's composition. Composition refers to where objects are placed in the scene and where you put the camera so that you can get the information that you need to get across to the viewer as effectively as possible. So the first thing that you want to be aware of is focal points. A focal point is an area on the scene where you want the viewer to actually spend the most time looking. Generally speaking, you want to have two, three, four, maybe five of these at most. If you have too many areas of interest in the scene, it's going to start looking like a spot the difference or something like that. It's just too overwhelming to look at and it's kind of just too busy and not a pleasant experience to look at things like that. Naturally, the eye wants to kind of rest in an area and look at a specific thing. So where do we put these points of interest? Well, a good general rule to follow is the rule of thirds. The idea here is if you take a canvas of any aspect ratio and you split it vertically into even thirds and then you split it horizontally into thirds, where those lines intersect and they make crosses, those are usually really good points to place the most interesting parts of your canvas. The reason for this basically is if you look at an image, your eyes kind of focus your field of view on that image and because most people have two working eyes and they're offset an even distance from the middle, the points at a third of the canvas are kind of the most comfortable places on an image to look. Once you know about the rule of thirds, you're going to start seeing it everywhere. I use it extensively in my animation work. It's basically my go-to composition guide. And if you look at pretty much any famous painting, you're going to start seeing it again and again. Even if you look at something like a portrait, where you might not think it applies necessarily because the person is sitting in the middle of the frame, what you'll often notice is actually some of the focal points, for instance, maybe the eye will actually line up with the rule of thirds. This painting by Rembrandt is one of my favourite examples of the rule of thirds in action. Two of the people in attendance here have their faces exactly lined up with the focal points. The face of the corpse is also lined up with the focal point and the hand that they're all looking at, which is being dissected, is pretty much lined up to one as well. Now, having said that, you don't necessarily have to have something on all four of those focal points every time. In fact, that can actually make the composition much worse sometimes. I was looking at a painting recently, and it was a really good painting, except one problem that I'd had. There was a castle, which was lined up to two of the focal points, there was like a knight who was looking at the castle, he was lined up to another one and for some reason they decided to put a flock of birds flying above his head, directly above his head on the other focal point. You could say what they were trying to do but it was just pointless. You don't have to have something on every one of those points. If you would like to use a composition like the Rule of Thirds in Blender, the software can actually make your life a little bit easier rather than using guesswork there. Uh, if we select the camera and go to Composition Guides, you can see we can select thirds here and if we come out of rendered view you can see we now have these markers here which are lining up approximately with the paintings on the wall. There's also other compositions that you can use like uh, diagonal which is going to split the composition up diagonally and there's lots of different composition shapes that you can try. Now I'd be remiss to make a video like this without talking about the golden ratio. The golden ratio is based on Fibonacci tiles. If you know the Fibonacci sequence, basically the idea is that each one of these tiles is the sum of the two tiles before it. So one plus one is two, two plus one is three, three plus two is five, five plus eight is 13, etc. And if you connect the corners of these sorts of tiles together, you get the spiral pattern, which appears quite often in nature. And some artists have convinced themselves that this is like some magical sequence that if you apply the spiral to things then you get a great composition and a lot of the times as far as i'm concerned it's bullshit they just cheat they take this composition and they apply it over like one part of a picture and they're like oh see how well that works i think it's a load of bollocks i think you could take a picture of anything it could be like a, a trash can or a picture of a cat's butt in fact let's try that cats Butthole cartoon. This is going to get me on a list. <laughs> uh, yeah, say it works. What a great composition. So I, I think it's a load of crap. If you look at this, I can't help but notice that the big section is almost exactly two thirds every time. 
So if you split this into a third, and then you split that into a third, and you split that into a third, you get this Fibonacci tile thing pretty much. It's just the rule of thirds, but you should know about it anyway. Symmetry is something you want to be very careful of when you're working on any sort of composition. Symmetry almost always looks artificial. It's very rare that you see anything in nature that's perfectly balanced on either side. It can be a very powerful tool if you're trying to make something look very distinctive. Uh, Wes Anderson is one of those directors that has an incredibly distinctive style, and you'll notice that he constantly uses symmetry and things being framed in the middle of the shot when he's working on his projects. But a lot of the time, what it does is it gives you kind of an unsettling feeling. Um, if you're ever trying to make something look creepy or artificial, making everything symmetrical is a really good way of going about it. So something that you want to almost always avoid is kissing and a similar idea, which uh, sometimes gets called parallax kissing or false parallax. Uh, kissing is basically when you have two objects in 3D space that aren't actually touching each other, but they're lined up in such a way that it looks like they are. Imagine this is the sun and this is a landscape. The last thing that you would want to have in a composition is the two objects to be lined up like this. Because when you look at this at a glance, this looks like the sun is now resting on the earth and it's very weird. Now obviously most of the time you're going to know that the sun isn't resting on the earth, but if these are just two objects in 3D space that uh, might be resting on each other, it can be sometimes just hard to read. What I would almost always do is move this either up slightly or make sure that it's overlapping in such a way they definitely aren't shown. So the other thing that I was talking about there is if we imagine we have say um, like a fence or something like this or a cube, you can probably see the problem here straight away. All the parallel lines here are sort of converging at the exact same point. So the top of this fence and the, the horizon here are lined up perfectly, which just looks really strange. Whereas if I move that back just slightly, now it's much easier to read that, okay, this is a fence and it's not lying on the earth because we can see there's a bit of sky behind it. Same thing here, if we have this lined up to the edge of there, it almost looks like this is a part of this Whereas if we just move it away slightly or overlap them, it's just much easier to read what's going on. It's also important to have a good sense of balance in a composition. You don't want to have a scenario where you have way too many things to look at in one part of the screen and nothing going on in the rest of the screen. The only time you can get away with that usually is if there's basically only one object such as a person in the composition. For example, this scene which I made earlier I think has a pretty nice balance to it. It's obviously a fairly symmetrical composition, but it has roughly the same amount of things to look at on either side of the screen. Whereas if we move some of these objects and delete some others, so everything is only on the left hand side of the screen, this is much less comfortable to look at. Your eyes just constantly wander over to the left side of the image, and every time you look at the right hand side of the image, you get bored. Whereas once again, if we look at the original, now it's a much nicer balance. This video is sponsored by me and my interior masterclass training course for Blender. Over seven and a half hours of video, I'll take you step by step through my entire process for creating this realistic interior scene. If you're interested in creating beautiful environments or you just want to level up your Blender skills in general, this course is a great place for you to start. As long as you've got a basic knowledge of Blender, it's beginner friendly, but it's especially helpful to intermediate users who want to take their Blender artwork to the next level. It comes with a large pack of useful interior assets such as light switches and door handles. I'm currently working on a new module for this course covering the creation of an entirely different room. If you have the interior masterclass already, you'll gain access to that shortly. Check out the link in the description to pick up your copy of the interior masterclass today. Now this next tip kind of goes a little bit with the point I made earlier about balance. I'm not sure exactly what to call this. I suppose you could call it like the rule of three or something. But generally speaking, you want to avoid giving uh, two objects in your scene or two different features equal amounts of weight. What I mean by weight is sort of visual importance. Like I have these two spheres here, They're the same color. They're almost identical in position. One of them's slightly closer to the camera than the other one, but apart from that, it's just a very boring thing to look at. You don't really know which one of these spheres you're supposed to pay attention to. But if we just duplicate one of these and put it in the background, all of a sudden, at least I think that makes for much more visual interest. 
I don't really know why that is exactly, but your eyes now kind of automatically sort of follow through the pack and it actually gives you something to do. It gives you something kind of to look at. So here's another example of the same thing. I have two trees here. In theory, this should be an okay canvas. It's symmetrical. Uh, the trees line up with the rule of thirds roughly, but there's something about it which is just very, very boring, right? But if we take one of these trees and duplicate it, keep it kind of next to the other one, but move it to say here, I think instantly that's just a more interesting image to look at. I don't know why that is because it's basically the same thing, which is adding that one extra tree and kind of breaking up the symmetry and redefining the balance just makes it work better. Earlier in the video, I talked about the importance of making points of visual interest in the scene where the viewers can look and where you're basically instructing the viewers to look. While the actual placement of those points is important, there are other tricks that we have as artists that we can use to draw the viewer's eyes to a specific place. One of my favorite tips for that is to use depth. I use this all the time. Anyone who's watched my videos will know that I use volumetrics a lot. And there's a good reason for that. Now you might recognize this shot if you do watch this channel. I made a Godzilla short movie, I think about a year ago, and it opens up with this shot where you have this little boat and it disappears in the background and it's replaced by Godzilla's fins sticking out the water. This looks quite ridiculous, by the way, if you watch. I didn't animate this at all. So um, yeah, this shouldn't work as a composition because the two elements that you want to look at in the scene are overlapping each other. But because I used really heavy volumetrics for this shot, the boat is obviously the thing that first draws your eye. It disappears right on the rule of thirds, by the way. This pays on the rule of thirds and then the new high contrast part of the scene that pops into place is Godzilla. Now you can barely see the boat at all and you're basically forced to look at these spines, fins, whatever you want to call them. Another good way to draw the viewer's eyes to specific areas is to use focus and depth of field. In Blender, we can very easily change the aperture of the camera to make something in particular in focus. This is a shot from an animation that so far I've never released. Now, obviously there's quite a lot going on here. So to make it a little bit easier to read, I set up a object in the scene, which is called focus, which is just this cube. And that moves to wherever I want the camera to actually be able to see the clearest. And then in the camera settings, all I need to do is turn on depth of field and select that as the focus. Now you can see that this, uh, this book here, and to a lesser extent, these things are in focus and everything else in the background is blurry, which makes the things in the foreground just pop out a little bit more. I knew this was gonna be an incredibly dark scene. It kind of has to be for the atmosphere. That really helps. And then as the scene moves forward, this thing here is slowly uh, like dripping into this cup. And you can see that the focal point is on the cup and everything else in the background is just really blurred out. So using focus is a really nice way to make things pop from the background. You can see if I turn the focus off there, it's much harder to read the image because now you're noticing details in the background and your eyes don't really know where to look. So finally using light and contrast is another way that you can really tell the viewer exactly what they should be looking at. A good example of that would probably be the Godzilla movie that I made again. There's a shot in there where Godzilla's coming out of the water and I purposely used a lot of volume and I made the background sky really bright so that the silhouette of Godzilla would pop and it would be immediately clear exactly what you need to be looking at. One topic that I almost forgot to mention, but is actually really important is leading lines. Leading lines are lines or shapes in the composition, which basically direct the viewer where to look. It's either, you know, maybe sets of parallel lines like a road or railway tracks going through the scene, or it can be just something that's kind of pointing in the shape of an arrow or a person who's looking in a particular direction and it just screams at the viewer, look at this thing. And you can build up a series of these too. So for instance, you could have a composition where you have a guy who's looking over the horizon at an object, and then you can kind of have the shape of the object pointing at something else. So your eyes would naturally look at him, and then you would look at the thing, and then you would look at the other thing. Now you need to be careful with leading lines because they can have the adverse effect. If you have leading lines are pointing to nothing, then that's really distracting. If you have something that's kind of shaped like an arrow, but it just points to nothing in the scene, or even worse, if you have 
something that's kind of pointing towards the end of the canvas, then that can be really distracting. For instance, right now, I'm kind of on the rule of thirds mark and I'm facing in a direction that's kind of towards you and towards this space, right? But if I turned myself, so now in the frame, I'm pointing like away, that's a really weird composition because you don't know what I'm looking at. The canvas just ends here and you don't know, I've been blinded by the light at the moment, but you don't really know what I'm looking at. It's much more natural if I'm facing into the negative space on the canvas than facing off the canvas. So that just about wraps up episode two of Fundamentals for 3D Artists. Make sure you check out the link in the description where you can get a copy of my course, the Interior Masterclass. As I said earlier on, I'm working on a whole new module at the moment, which is probably going to add about three to five hours of extra content on top of the seven and a half hours that's already included in the course. If you already have the course or you buy it today, you will be able to get all of the updates for free. So you will get that module as well and any other modules that I might make in the future. Thanks to everybody who's bought the course, by the way, and people who've been kind enough to reach out to me or to rate it five stars on the store. I really appreciate that. And I'm glad to see that people are enjoying the course so much. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you soon with a new video.